How are you guys feeling today? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm ready to go to bed myself, but got to do another origins class after this. So today we're going to talk about tunneling, or we might get to tunneling. But first, I want to make sure I don't just gloss over. Remember, I said I had a mistake in this equation here last class period. And so I went through and I did correct it. The problem was just that there was an errant two there. So I just erased it. Now it's better. And of course, I corrected this term here. That one was incorrect as well. But I figured I might as well go through and do the problem. Now, this is an example problem. Um, it's example, or pro, not example, but problem 222 from the textbook on page 67. Because there's some things to learn in going through the problem. So the problem says to take an initial psi of x0 is equal to a e to the minus a x squared. And first it says to normalize it. Well, we did that without a problem. And, and I've done this problem, by the way, enough times between last night and this morning. I'm starting to memorize the Gaussian integrals. <laughs> Just, you know, feel, feel a little good about my math skills, mostly because I had to do an integral like five times before I got it right. But let's gloss over that part. <laughs> so first we um, found the normalization constant and then we took that and we found what the the phase space or the k space transformation of it was so oh no i put them actually below so here i did the work starting to ending so we start with that equation for psi and then here's the definition whoa, the definition for that Fourier transform to get it into K space. And so doing that integral, you of course have, there's the value, the normalization constant, there's our E to the minus AX squared, and then E to the minus IKX that's part of the transformation. So here is rewriting it in simpler form and you have that unpleasant quadratic exponent. And so then we did the complete the square and here I have it in four simple, actually four simple lines. It could be made shorter. I want to make sure I covered all everything. So basically for my method of complete the squares, I said, okay, I'm going to want Y squared minus C squared to be my exponent. One thing that has Y, one thing that doesn't. And so I set Y squared minus C squared is equal to the actual exponent. Now you will notice the minus sign here. I left that. So I'm just going to have a negative exponent. So then if y squared minus c squared is equal to this, then I just add plus c squared to both sides to get y squared is equal to ax squared plus ikx plus c squared. But then if this is going to complete the square, I know that this here is going to be my first term squared. So I take the square root of that to put right here. And similarly, the, this is the square of my last term. So I take the square root of that to get my C here. And then I, ex I expanded this so that we see the middle term is 2 square root AXC. And so then by comparison, Okay, let's change colors yet again. This here must equal this here because we've got equal signs everywhere. So the term that has a single X here has to be the same as the term with a single X there. And so I just set those terms equal to each other. IKX is equal to two square root A X C. Solve for C by divide by everything that's not C. And I find C is equal to IK over two square root A. So my y is equal to square root ax plus c now. And so that's the end of that. Now I said, now that I have that, 
Let's find dy is equal to square root of a dx. Solve that for dx. dx is dy over square root a. And my exponent, so here's the original exponent with the minus sign factored out, is equal to y squared minus c squared. Well, if I take my c, my c was i k over 2 square root a, so I square that. i squared is minus 1. So minus k squared over 4a. Minus sign here. Minus from the i squared made it a plus. So now I can rewrite just the integral part as this, where I've done the two substitutions. I split my exponent or my exponential into the part that's dependent on y and the part that's independent. And I made a substitution for dx. And then I simply did the integral of the things that I circled there. Right, the constant stays out here, and that integral is just going to be square root of pi over a. Yes, man. Oh no, it is just one. It's this this here. <laughs> I was like, man, after all that work, I made a mistake. That's that a. Because, yes, you're right. It's just square root of pi over 1. Like I told you, I've, I've got these down after so many times. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what did I do now? Okay, so this was the integral part going back up. We just worked out this integral. And so if my phi is a function of k is going to be this constant stuff times what we just found. So here's the constant stuff times the integral, the constant stuff. <laughs> Here I did make a mistake because I wrote this twice. Times what we just found. At least that's a very obvious mistake. And so here's my phi sub k. Now I'm going to go off script right here and say, okay, if that's my phi sub k, can I find the expectation value for k and k squared? What does it mean to find the expectation value? Okay, it is the average value you would find with a very large number of measurements. That's correct. How do we calculate it? Oh, how do we calculate it? Yeah. I, I am glad that, that you answered that. What I meant to ask was how we calculate it, but you answering was important, making sure you've got the ideas of what we're finding in place. So how do you calculate that? Yes. That, that's my point. Okay. Then, yeah, OK. And then it's the, the integral of the infinity of the space of e, tap, e star k. E. Because we're in k space, we're using our wave function in k space, and we're using k as our variable in the integral. And so if we do this, equal to integral from minus infinity to infinity. The phi star, well, look, that's all real. So phi star is just phi. Yes, that is what I'm going to do, but I have to write it out long form first. So nobody says, well, I'm not sure. He might have done that wrong because we know I make mistakes. Okay, so there's my phi star. Now I need my k operator. What would my k operator be? K. It turns out it's just k. I probably gave it away by writing it the first time. Just like when we were in position space, the position operator was just x. When you're in k space, the k operator is just k. 
and the position operator is not x when you're in, in k space. In fact, it's going to be a derivative with respect to k. And then I have to write my original phi. And what's this integral equal to? Um, I, whoops, I missed. <laughs> that's the part that's odd, yes. <laughs> Very good call. I'm just like, it's got to be this function. That's not a function. That's the constant. Yes. <laughs> Very good call. <laughs> that would be a bizarre one. So even times... It's just zero because you have the integral of an odd function is zero over symmetric limits. So we don't do the integral. We could have, but we would have gotten zero. So that was a cakewalk. What about expectation value of k squared? It's not zero, right? Yeah, it's not zero. Yeah, it's going to be even, even, even. So yeah, let's let's take advantage of copy and paste with the new tip. I should be able to copy this whole thing without messing up. Okay, you guys notice it's not jumping now. I'm so pleased about that. Yeah. Okay, that's probably a bad idea. Let's keep the equal signs separate and just erase one of them, or both of them, as the case would be. <laughs> Okay, so now we have that integral. Or being a little more astute, as you wanted to say the first time around anyway, 1 over 2a pi to the 1 half power, because I squared it, integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus k squared over we have to just double it since it's over 4, 1 fourth plus 1 fourth is 1 half. So we have that integral to do. Now we look at our Gaussian integral table. I'm going to write that. And the Gaussian integral table is 1 over... Well, we have to double it because the Gaussian table showed 0 to infinity. It's 1 over 4a, so you double that to 1 over 2a. So 1 over 2, my a in this case was 1 over 2a. I know it gets confusing when you're saying my a has a in it. Question? Yeah. No, we were just, we were debating the Gaussian. <laughs> no. Trust me, I've done this integral many times in the last 12 hours. <laughs> And then we have the square root of pi over a. So once again, pi over 1 over 2a. And that's my integral. Well, it's not super complicated because this 1 over 2a is the same as putting the 2a on top, right? And so this here, 1 over 2 times 1 over 2a is? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this one turned out nicely. So now this is, this is the expectation value for k squared. So what's the expectation value for momentum squared? Um, 
So we, we worked out, or we talked about last class, Barry, using the De Broglie relation that P is equal to H over lambda is equal to H bar K. And so my P operator is H bar K. H bar is constant. Go ahead. Right. That's easy. That's not the integral I was messing up. It's the other calculation for P squared. The one using the time dependent wave function. That's the one that gave me grief. In fact, I'm still wondering if I should do it or not because it's going to take me 20 minutes and I'm like 50% sure I'm going to make a mistake. I brought my paper, but if you can read my work, you're doing better than me. Okay, so why did I take this deviation right here? Well, what was the point I said at the beginning? You asked the question and I said, yes, that's the point. Why, why did I find the K and K squared? Because your, your expectation value, it, it doesn't matter what space you're in. So the operator depends on the space, but I can just find the expectation value in a different space. It still needs to be the expectation value for the observable. And so this is the correct expectation value for the momentum, even though we didn't find it in position space, which is what we're comfortable with. Okay, so now coming back to now apply the inverse Fourier transform to return to position space with time dependence now. So this is how we're going to get time dependence into this to see how our wave function changes in time. So this is the equation for the reverse Fourier transform looks just like the initial one except we now have the time dependence folded in into our transformation so just putting in the substitution here's the phi sub k <laughs> simplifying it the constant out front's a little more convoluted I know that you could combine these into a more complex looking single term, but there's no point in it. And then we have to calculate another integral. It's pretty clear why calculus is required for this class. So I, I separate this into a term with K squared and a term with K. And just as before, we'll complete the square. This completing the square is a little more complex. That's exactly the same mechanism. I said y squared minus c squared is equal to that exponent with the minus sign factored out. And then add the c squared to both sides. Square root of this has to be my, oh, wrong place. <laughs> Square root of that first thing has to be the first part of y and the square root of the second part or the last part of the second. Same as before, now I expanded that out, so I have the center term, or as we call it, the cross terms, is equal to the center term, set those equal to each other, and solve for C by dividing by everything that ain't C. And once again, you'll notice that the Ks cancel, just like in the previous time, it was the Xs that canceled. And so now our C is Ix over 2 square root of this stuff. You can write it different ways. I just chose to keep it, keep it that way. So now I have my y. Since I have the y, I can find dy in terms of dk. Solve that for dk because dk is what I had in my integral. And then my exponent, my full exponent, which is y minus c squared, y squared minus c squared, is equal to this. So here's my new exponent. So I <clears throat> make that substitution for just the integral. So there's the exponential. Here's the substitution for dk is equal to dy over this stuff. And we have to do the integral. Well, once again, 
that integral just has the square root of pi for the result, or square root of pi over one. And this time I, I actually once wrote it, putting this in under that square root of pi to combine them. Nice side note, that, that's not a smart move. It's better to keep them separate. <sighs> so now, putting it all together, I'll substitute for this integral what we just found. And this time I didn't repeat, any, <laughs> didn't repeat anything. And so here is my time-dependent psi. What you see here is, at time equals zero, now that I have it correct, now that I got that extra two out of the way, if time is zero, the denominators will just be one. So the exponent will be e to the minus ax squared, and the bottom is just over square root of one. That's what we started with, which had better be the case, because we started with psi of x comma time equals zero. By putting time equals zero, I'd better have the same equation or I made a mistake, which is how I identified that I had a mistake on Wednesday. What this shows you is that your, your Gaussian wave packet is not going to stay the same over time. It's going to expand. And so you could plot this at different times to see how it expands. What I want to do is now to find the expectation value for position and for position squared. And while we're at it, I'll write these down. I'm probably not going to do it like I said. Momentum and momentum squared. So how do I find the expectation value for position? Okay, what should I do now? No, no, I want you to make my life easy. Yes. I mean, cry would have cry would have worked, but I'd rather recognize, oh, this is just zero because it's integral of an odd integrand over symmetric limits. So, boom. I thought we just Says the math major. Okay, minus infinity to infinity. Uh, we got to put the whole thing in there, so that's going to be Square. Okay, thank you. Yes, we can. So it's going to be to the one half power because I have it twice. So one fourth times one fourth is one half. This one here is going to get rid of the square root in the denominator because I'm going to have it twice. Wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. Because the complex conjugate, right. So I can't do it so easily. I'm going to have breath two. Yes, I've done this enough that it actually feels natural writing out 2i h bar a t over m. So there's my constants brought out.
Look about right. Notice they're complex conjugates. I actually have the order reversed. I'll fix the order so it's the same as the order should come. So combining these is not just adding them like we did before because we have the complex conjugate. But it's not super hard. Why is it not super hard? Well, give myself a common denominator. I simply multiply the left one by You can see why I got comfortable writing this many, many times. Uh, you good? Notice one plus two i h h bar a t over m plus one minus two i h bar a t over m. That's just two on top. And on bottom, minus i squared makes a plus. Two times two is four. h bar squared, a squared, t squared over m squared. So <clears throat> this here, likewise, that's got square roots, but it's the same thing. So my whole integral is equal to square root, I can't remember from one moment to the next. So there I've combined those two square roots, the, the complex conjugates. <clears throat> Simple, right? Simple. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's <clears throat> I, I just hope I haven't made any mistakes because you know when you're writing it this many times, it's not beyond the realm of possibility. That is going to be one fourth times two, so one over two A, where A is 2a over 1 plus. So there's my first term. <clears throat> Square root of pi over that same thing that's in parentheses. All righty. What to do, what to do. What's the first thing that you would want to do? Okay. Get rid of those fractions. Get, of those fractions. Get to work. The first thing I want to do is to note that this 2A on bottom cancels with that 2A on top. This pi on top cancels that pi on bottom. This 1 over 1 over puts this on top, which cancels with that. Yay. Nice. <laughs> and so what I have for the entire thing is yes, that I have a problem with my 2, though. I made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. 
went over for a oh poo I swear it's not supposed to have that four. Maybe it does. We'll see. We will see. So there's my calculation. Like I said, that, that, that four doesn't feel right, but that's what I got, so I'm going with it. Now, why did I do all of that? Well, if you read the problem, you would have known. It, it, it just looked like I was saying, hey, what are these? Well, I was doing them because I want to check the uncertainty principle. This is the actual derivation for Heisenberg's version of the uncertainty principle. That is, if we have a Gaussian distribution, what are we going to have for the product of the uncertainties? So uncertainty in momentum is equal to the square root of And of course, I'm not putting the plus or minus value with the square root because, hey, we're, we're just looking at the magnitude after all. And uncertainty in position yeah. So our uncertainty relation So there's the first one. The second one was, and now we can check and see. Indeed, satisfaction, because it's right. So what did Heisenberg see? The minimum value is going to be what occurs when time is zero. When time is zero, you have h bar over two. But if time gets bigger, and even if you went backward in time, you would have a larger product of the uncertainties. Hence the relationship that it's greater than or equal to h bar over two. Hooray. Okay, I'm all excited, right? Yeah, first try. yeah exactly. <laughs> well, not the first try, like I said. <laughs> now, I, I am not going to do it just because it's going to take, I, I want to cover some more stuff. You can find the uncertainty in momentum using the position space psi here. It's a much more difficult integral simply because you've got much more pieces and you have to take the second derivative. So you have an X squared term and a, like I said, it took me many times, got it right at the end. That was this morning, just before my first class, I finally got it right. I didn't have time to type it up or anything. Um, otherwise I would have added to the end of this. So you can do it either way. Do it the easy way if it comes to it, you know? When you're doing a problem, if you find a way that's easier but correct 
and rigorous, not you know hand waving, then then go for it. Don't just say, well, I've got to do it the hard way because that's what he expects. Only if I say do it this way, do you have to do it that way? But it, but it does have to be rigorous. You can't just say, I've got this hunch. <laughs> okay, this, this slide here was just saying do the Heisenberg uncertainty. I just did it. So now we're going to change topics. On to the topic that was supposed to be today, which was talking about tunneling. And to talk about tunneling, we have to take a step back, look at what we've learned, and cover a few more interesting cases. We're not really going to get to tunneling today, I've got to tell you. We'll get to tunneling in our lectures on lectures on Monday. So what have we learned so far? We've learned about stationary bound states. We had stationary bound states that occurred when we had a particle that was confined, confined either by the infinite well or by the um, simple harmonic os or the simple harmonic function because the simple harmonic function ends up having infinite walls. They're not square walls, but if you go farther, it goes higher and higher. You're never going to have enough energy to get over that wall. And so you got stationary or bound states when you had walls that it couldn't get past so far. And those functions were normalizable and you had indexes, integers, so we had that n equals one state to n equals two state, etc. Then we also had the continuous or called scattering states. Continuous meaning that the wave function goes forever. Those weren't normalizable, hence we weren't really able to do our real quantum physics stuff with them. We did some good calculations, but we weren't able to do quantum physics. We were able to take a packet and do quantum physics calculations on that packet. Right? The calculation we just finished, that problem is totally legit because it was a packet. It was confined in space. So a real basic thing is you don't have quantization if it's unconfined. But when it's confined, then you're going to have the quantization. And we labeled those with a continuously varying K. Okay, so now we're going to take that and move forward to the Dirac Delta. I mentioned the Dirac Delta when we learned about the Kronecker Delta. The Dirac Delta is a delta function for a continuous function, and I may have spoken incorrectly of it before, so here I'm speaking very correctly of it. The function, delta function, has a value of infinity if x is equal to zero, and zero everywhere else. So if you graph that, very literally, your graph looks like that, except for this line goes up to infinity. But there is another piece to it. The area under this magenta line has to be 1. That's an important aspect of it. So that if you do an integral, and that's where I misspoke before. I said it's equal to 1 at that point and 0 everywhere else. It's when you do the integral. An integral of some function, well, in this case, the Dirac delta function, dx, is just going to be equal to 1. And if you put in some other function, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x delta x dx, since it has an area of 1, but only at that specific value of x equals 0, then that's going to have to be f of 0. Because it's whatever the value of f is at that point when the integral of delta x is 1. Or you can be a little trickier. The last step in our trickiness here is integral from minus infinity to infinity, f of x, Dirac delta of x minus a dx. In this case, what's the x value when the Dirac delta function is infinite? A. And so this is going to have to be equal to f of a. 
So the dry tile, and you've covered it in your math class, you said already, but just making sure that I cover it and cover it correctly instead of kind of flippantly like I did before. So we're going to consider first a potential energy well. That is our potential energy function goes like that. So with that potential energy well, that's a lot like our particle in a box, except for we don't have an infinite wall. And we have how thick is the box or how wide? Zero, right? It's of, of infinitesimal width. So we're going to solve this problem. We're going to solve it two different times. And you're probably thinking to yourself, it's ridiculous enough to solve it once. Why are we going to solve it twice? We're going to solve it twice first. And then second. So let's make sure that we understand what we're talking about here. So this is a graph, the green graph there is showing the potential energy let's say it's in EVs as a function of position and it's set so that this is zero potential energy obviously your potential energy reference point is random your particle could easily have an energy that's anywhere above the bottom of that, which was minus infinity. And so we're saying we're coming in here for part A. And of course, I use the wrong color if I'm going to color coordinate anything. Too many. All right. So red. We're saying this is our energy level. So our energy level is between the bottom of the well and zero, the top of the well. Because energy's reference point is arbitrary, that's perfectly acceptable. Now, if you look at this classically, where's my particle going to have to exist? Yeah, so the particle has to exist exactly right here classically. Quantum mechanically, not so much. We have to figure it out. But it's an allowed state. The second time we're going to do it, we're going to put a positive energy. So we're going to put energy up here. What would we have for our result classically in that case? It could be anywhere. It's a free particle, right? It's got enough energy. It's not not even affected by that well just flies right over it's kind of like saying you have an airplane you're coming across the grand canyon you know, does it get scattered off of the grand canyon when it flies over no it just goes over it doesn't care so that would be an exact analogy to the second case so for the first case here's our schrodinger equation we have our v potential energy function we've got the kinetic energy, and of course that's T psi plus V psi is equal to E psi. Simple enough? So what do we do? We're going to find a solution on each side of the delta function, and then we're going to use the delta function to tie the two sides together. So we have two regions. Region one will be Here, and region two will be there. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's look at this. If we are on, well, it doesn't matter which side we're on, frankly, we're going to have our relationship here give us, if we multiply both sides by 2m over h bar squared, we would have 
I'm sorry, I, I have to be a little careful. For x less than zero, it's equal to zero for the delta function. It's only not zero at x equals zero. And so that just disappears. So that term is not shown here because it's zero. So this is repeating the equation above just without that term. And then making a definition that kappa squared is equal to this. So kappa is equal to the square root of minus 2me over h bar squared. And of course, anyone starts to be a little uncomfortable when you say you have a square root of minus something. But remember, what was the value for our energy in this case? Energy is less than zero, so that means minus 2me over h bar squared is positive, which means kappa is a real value. It's not imaginary. Got to make sure we go through that and don't come back and say, but, but where'd the I go? Right? There's no I because taking the square root of a positive. And we're only taking the positive sense here for kappa. The form of the solution of this differential equation has to be e to the bx. So we're going to plug in e to the bx here. That is d second psi dx squared is equal to, if I take the second derivative of this function, what am I going to get? It's just b squared psi is the easiest way to write it. And so that means that my Schrodinger equation becomes... B squared psi equals kappa squared psi. That's one of your easier equations. A lot easier than the ones we did earlier today. So what conclusion can I draw from this about the value for B? Don't forget the plus or minus. So B is plus or minus square root of kappa squared. Since we specified that it's that kappa is a positive, it's just going to be equals plus kappa or minus kappa. Which means that my solution is A linear combination of those two possible values for b. So there's my solution. Now if this is going to be a quantum physics solution, what special condition do we have to have? It has to be continuous. Has to be continuous and it has to approach zero as x approaches zero, so it will be normalizable. And so as this was in the negative, so as x approaches negative infinity, what is e to the kappa x approach? Okay, so that was perfect. The a term is great. What does e to the minus kappa x approach? Okay, that's kind of a problem, right? So, so what does that tell us about this solution? The B has to be zero or else we don't have a solution. So we have our solution on the left-hand side is psi is equal to A e to the kappa X. Now let's go to the other side. Okay, so if we go to the other side, we're going to have exactly the same Schrodinger equation. It's just that it's this delta is zero for x greater than zero. And so all of our work is the same, but then we're going to have as x approaches plus infinity, and instead of a and b, we'll use, um, I think I use f and g. Yeah. I think I used f and g. 
Anyway, we know that e to the kappa x will approach infinity, and e to the minus kappa x will approach zero. And so that says that we're all, we can only have this term in the solution on the right-hand side. And so on the left-hand side, we have b e to the Oh, I put my I put my a and b in opposite order. Hence, having I feel dumb. It doesn't matter, but they're, they're different um, symbols. So we have the negative exponent on the right side, the positive exponent on the left side, and then we have psi must be boundary conditions. Psi must be continuous, and except for when you have an infinite potential, the slope must be continuous. Well, here we have an infinite potential because of the delta function, but the psi must be continuous means that psi of zero from the left has to be psi of zero from the right, which means that my two constants are the same. So I can now write psi is equal to b e to the minus kappa absolute value of x because when x was negative then we had the negative sign to make it positive when x was positive we had the or excuse me the other way around when x is negative we had the positive sign to make the total exponent negative when x is positive we're going to have the negative sign to make the total exponent negative so there's our solution then we have to normalize it we'll start up there on monday